Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Happy Aloha Friday and welcome to today's episode of Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. We all want to be safe and secure and to live without fear. And that is a human right that we all have. However, in the U.S., gun violence is an epidemic that directly threatens these rights, and we have reached a point where this is an issue that must be addressed as a human rights crisis. A staggering number of people are killed with guns in the United States every year. More than 30,000 men, women, and children are killed by guns every year in the United States. Among high-income countries, the United States accounts for 80% of all gun deaths in the world. Yes, you heard it right. 86% of all women are killed by guns, and 87% of all children younger than 14 are killed by guns in the United States. African American, Latinos, and Native Americans are disproportionately killed by gun violence in this country as well. What fuels this epidemic? Federal, state, and local governments are not meeting obligations under their international law to protect people's safety because laws and gun and law on guns in the United States are inconsistent and weak. None of us are exempt from being a victim of gun violence, not even here in the state of Hawaii, where we have one of the best gun control laws in the nation. Today, we are graced with the presence of two amazing students and activists, Taylor McKenzie, who is a senior at Sacred Hearts Academy of Honolulu, and Sarah Catino, UH Manoa student. And uh, the, stu the Hawaiian students are standing in solidarity in support of Parkland students, staff and parents on March 14th to say never again. And again, uh, a march in our Lives for March on March 24th. And today's discussion will shift this uh, focus on uh, from gun control to the rights we all have to live free from violence and fear and on common sense legislation at the state and federal levels that can protect everyone from gun violence. This is a student-led and community-driven movement of thousands of individuals who demand that their human rights to be safe and protected from gun violence happens in the United States. On that note, welcome to our program. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. What an honor. So, I always start the show by giving our viewers a little perspective uh, about where you come from and uh, uh, what are you up to in your school and how did you get involved with this movement? So I'm going to start with you, Taylor. Okay, I got really inspired talking to the other students at my school. We really wanted to do something because we're the same age as the victims of the Parkland shooting. And this is something that affects us, even though in Hawaii we're so apathetic to what is happening on the mainland that I think that some friends and I, we really wanted to make a difference. And that's why I reached out to Sarah on the Women's March website. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got connected to this. Oh, that is wonderful. And what about you, Sarah? And how awesome is that? Um, yeah. I got involved with this, well, this per movement in particular, um, about two months ago, I had Scarlett Lewis come to speak to our classroom at UH. And she's one of the mothers of a six-year-old boy that was murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Um, and when you meet a parent that lost a kid at six years old, it's hard to not feel connected to that person and feel like you should do something to change it if you are in the position to do it. Um, and my whole adult life <laughs> this far has been to put myself in a position to be the change. Instead of just talking about it, I feel that it's important to get out there and do things and to get the education that you need to be able to do that. Um, and when the Parkland shooting happened, we, Women's March had created a Facebook page um, to reach out and, and formulate walkouts for students in high schools. And I just went out there and said, hey, I'll, I'll help. You know, I don't know how I can be of service, but I'm, I'm down to do it. And that's kind of how I met this 
smart <laughs> high school ever. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about uh, all the students who really also uh, came together here in Hawaii and said we want to be really uh, the leading uh, organizing and voice and asking for community support uh, uh, for this movement to happen here. Uh, so like, you have other uh, schools and other students who have been involved in the co-organizing of the events that we're going to be having in Oahu? Yeah, I think that a lot of high schools, middle schools, and even elementary schools um, are getting involved. And it's really like the most grassroots of a grassroots effort, like organization I've ever seen. It started with something short on Facebook and having mm -hmm. people reach out and putting an email out there and saying, if you want to get involved, and just last week we had the meeting yes. and over 40 people came just for the planning meeting yeah. um, for the March 14th walkout at UH. Uh, their school's on break that week, so we invited any students who are on spring break during the week of the 14th to come to our event um, at UH Manoa on the 14th. 10 o'clock in the morning. Right. Um, and from that, we've had students, students from Kaiser High School. Just yesterday, I spoke with a, um, an eighth grader at Moana Lua Middle School, and they're doing a walkout. Their, their school actually changed standardized testing, or I'm not sure if it was standardized, but they changed test um, scheduling for the 14th mm -hmm. and the bell schedule so that they'd be able to walk out in solidarity with the rest of the students. And that's wonderful. And I was going to ask uh, you, Taylor, and for you too, uh, Sarah, you know, interject any time. Uh, you have made a remark um, in your initial statement about the apathy that you saw uh, initially from students in response to gun violence uh, on the mainland. So my question to you is, why do you think this is happening here in Hawaii, and uh, um, what can uh, you know students and the community do to support uh, uh, schools and also students and parents to be more educated and engaged actively uh, to get the word out too? I think that what's most important is to start having conversations, to talk to people about this. This is an issue that we believe that we're safe from on, on, in Hawaii because we do have some of the best gun legislation in the United States. But there's just a threat at Mid-Pacific High School and last year at UH. There's, we're not immune to this. We're not immune to gun violence. No one is. Exactly. And I think that what really impacted me was I have a friend at my school and she called me in like the early morning just she was so upset and she was like oh my god we need to do something this is not right and I was like yeah we do mm -hmm. because so often at my school we have discussions and we talk about how this is terrible but we don't do anything more it ends with a discussion and I think that that's why the second step after you start talking to people is to do something to reach out to do what I did with Sarah to just email people to connect over social media because that is the power of social media and that's the power of people my age. We have this ability right at our fingertips to connect with anyone across the world and I think right. that's really why this is happening now is because not only is it youth-led, it's connecting to everyone through the media. Exactly and uh, you know I think you touched on a very important point of this full sense of security that we have here in Hawaii uh, of being immune from, uh, you know, having our youth impacted by gun violence. And the truth of the matter is, it can happen to any one of us. And yes, I think it is up to students and uh, our youth and everyone in the community to demand uh, that our representatives at the local level and at the federal level create stricter uh, laws, you know, for gun control and reform as well, so that all of us are safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And students and young people have enough to worry about going to school and with, from home stuff and, and schoolwork and having jobs in high school and all this other stuff that going to school and when you're sitting in a classroom and the door opens, your first sh thought shouldn't be, oh, um, like, I hope that we're okay. And I know for me that there's times that that definitely happens. Or when somebody's walking down the hallway when class is in session, there's that sense of unease. 
and that shouldn't be. You know, we like to think that we live in such a wonderful country and, and place that we can live freely. Um, but when you sit in a classroom and you're trying to get an education and you're distracted from what your classmates or your professors are saying because of uh, footsteps in the hallway, I mean, how is that conducive to learning yeah, or even I, wellness? Exactly. Right? Yes. So my question to you, even though we do get the sense that students in Hawaii feel a little bit isolated and safe, how have the shootings on the mainland uh, uh, impacted you emotionally as a student, uh, as you are more aware, and uh, uh, what would make you feel safer and your peers safer in your school setting and in your community? I take the bus uh, to and from school, and I found myself after the shooting looking around at these kids who were my age and younger and thinking about what would happen if a shooter came on? The bus, I mean, there isn't many exits. There aren't, we would be stuck. And I just, I think I would feel a lot safer knowing that there is no possibility of that happening. There's, there's no possibility of that happening anywhere in the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that the solution is multifaceted, right? And everybody says, I've been getting some backlash lately, and they're like, well, what's the solution? How are you gonna you know, solve this problem? And I don't think that it's any one answer. Um, and I think that it's obviously more gun control. Sorry, people don't want to hear it, but mm -hmm. it's, it's right. the truth. Um, and, it's, and we have to look into that. We have to at least be willing to look into that fact and decide where that goes. We have yeah. gun laws that have been written for much less than 17 you know, students and their faculty being killed in a school. And why we're so quick to just turn that down and say, absolutely not, it must be something else. Well, it might be something else, but it might be that too. And why not you know, change the culture around gun violence and change the culture on how we speak with other individuals and teach our kids to be loving and compassionate when they're young? And sure, if you want to talk about mental health, we can, we can go that route too. But we know that that's not really the issue here. Um, but it would be all of those things. And right now, we're kind of at a stalemate. We're getting small victories, especially today in Florida. But the fact that so many people are just like, nope, don't want to talk about it, can't take our guns. And we're like, well, I want to get an education. And I don't want you know this girl to go to school tomorrow and, and that be the last day. Right. And uh, uh, you know, there's a big difference between the Second Amendment rights of carrying a concealed weapon which was, you know, something that was uh, defined uh, so many decades ago, where there were no AR-15s and k 47 So I don't think that as a nation, you know, in any civilized or uncivilized, I, I, you know, society, there is room for anyone. Uh, to carry uh, guns and munitions that are designed for war, you know, and that it's so easily accessible by yeah. civilians, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, you have to look at the source of, you know, and how easy it is to get uh, these machines and, uh, and all of the carnage that happens year after year. Columbine is just having its 20th anniversary um, I think it's like next month, right? April 20th. April 20th. Yeah, April 20th. Yeah. And to think that 20 years later, we are still here dealing with the same issues. And this cannot be normalized. And I think no. that this movement of enough is enough, uh, you know, is very uh, in the right time. I would argue that it's past the right time, yes. that it should have happened 19 years ago when the Columbine shooting happened. It should have happened last month. It should have happened years ago. This is way past the time, and it's sad that we're yes. still dealing with this. And yes. I honestly think that if the Founding Fathers did see the type of weapons that we have today, that they wouldn't have included the Second Amendment. They would have changed it in a way that protected everyone, because we are the nation of the free. And I have the freedom to go to school and not be afraid. And that right. should trump anyone's desire to have a gun. And I think that Really, we need to start looking at that. When we look at our gun legislation, we have to see what our priorities are. Exactly. Is it education, or is it people's right to have a gun? Yeah. And mm -hmm. more importantly, education is very important, mm -hmm. but is it people's safety? 
at right. stake. You know, right. that is what should be priority. Everybody's uh, safety first and not protecting gun rights. Mm -hmm. And that, that there is a disconnect to that. So uh, we're going to take a quick break and <laughs> jump right in again. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Yay. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host Beatrice Cantemo and we are back with Taylor McKenzie and with Sarah Catino. So we were talking about the United States Second Amendment and uh, how um, in 2018 uh, we may need a little adjustment in interpretation of it. So who would like to speak fast on that? <laughs> I'll go. I would like to start off by saying when the Constitution was written, us three women wouldn't be sitting in this room discussing the laws that we're having or anyway. Um, so clearly we, we make amendments and we ratify them when we feel like um, they're what's right for the country and for the people of the country, not the lobbyists of the country, not the NRA. Um, and I think that just the fact that we progress as a nation, that's supposed to be one of the, the amazing things of America and a democracy is being able to have a say in what goes on and be able to vote the th for the things that you want um, and make progress and forward progress. And we don't want to go back. And I know I think that whole happenstance is making a lot of people in the country uneasy. And I think that's why the there's so much polarization and there's so much opposite or opposition and it's hard to s meet in the middle right now especially, but we need to say something's not working. And we need to, we can look at the Second Amendment and say, well, when the Founding Fathers, the Second Amendment was put in place for militias, right? It wasn't, they, it, of course it says for an individual to bear arms and have a militia, you know. Um, these things are different today. If the government was coming to take us over, and we've seen governments take over a people many times with or without guns, you know, your AR-15 at your house isn't going to stop them anyway. You know, there's a reason why flamethrowers are illegal and we don't have tanks in our backyard. You know, there's just a, a line that needs to be drawn somewhere. You know, and when the, the AR-15 and, and then the M-16 were made for, for the military during Vietnam, they were made literally to cause more damage, to go into a human person and destroy them. It wasn't, you know, made for protection in your home. It was made to kill the most people possible. And why that fact is so hard for some people to, to see and acknowledge and then say, okay, all right, maybe we can make a little bit of, of a difference here, right. you know? Yes, yes. And um, would you like to add something to that? <laughs> I think it's sad that when people think of the United States of America, they think of fast food and gun violence. Is that what we want to be known for? It's, there's so many other things that are incredible about us. This is Women's History Month, March, and I have seen girls from high schools all across Hawaii just come together. And, mm -hmm. and that's what we should be known for. We should be known for collaboration. And that's sad that's not what we're seeing. And that when we think of the history that we want to create now, how do we want to re be remembered? I don't Absolutely. think. Yeah. And I think to bring it to a micro perspective too, we need to look at countries that are uh, in the middle of uh, conflicts and wars. 
and that you all know that these uh, individuals in their life, families and children, I mean, uh, are really uh, massacred, you know, and that the, these guns are utilized. And we all have these images, you know, that's so gruesome of uh, gun, you know, wound violence and fatalities. And this is what we are actually fighting for by protecting the Second Amendment of the Constitution the way it is right now, and that we need to start making those connections. I actually come from Brazil, where, uh, and I was raised at in a city near Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and in my campus, uh, when I was a medical student, we had actually physicians coming uh, from uh, Iraq uh, in the 90s, in the early 90s, to learn uh, how we were handling gun wound shots of individuals who were uh, injured by AK-15, I'm sorry, AR-15 and AK-47 guns. Uh, and uh, you know, it's not pretty. You know, like when you you know when you see all the countries, and actually Rio de Janeiro is a very interesting. Uh, place for the world to look at it, especially the United States right now, because we've been dealing with this level of gun violence for the past 30 years, where these weapons have been in the hands of civilians and unfortunately also of individuals who commit crimes. And so life becomes very disposable. And uh, we have the uh, numbers equivalent of civil war every year. Well, you know, like a couple of years ago, we had 33,000 individuals who were killed by gun violence, uh, you know, in the country alone. And that's unacceptable. And I really hope that, uh, you know, in the United States, that, you know, everybody, every state, every community really becomes, um, you know, un unified. Uh, and really work uh, with solutions, and uh, regardless of political affiliation, you know, this is about everyone's safety and wellness, you know. Yeah. So, um, let's talk about March 14th. What do you have planned for your campus and for your school, and what do you know is happening for our island with other schools and also for other islands? So I know, so for UH um, at Manoa, we are having a, it's a student-led walkout um, at 10 a.m. We have asked, um, well, the Parkland students have, have initially asked, and we're kind of following their lead, to get up and leave your classroom. And we're asking that they walk to the Bachman lawn, which is essentially the front lawn of UH Manoa. Um, we have invited any students that don't have a, a home that day that are on spring break to come. Uh, the walkout is from 10 a.m. until 10, 17 a.m. on Wednesday, March 14th. Um, but at UH, I keep saying, since we're the big kids and we get to make a little bit more of our own decisions, we're going to kind of have a rally there until 1 o'clock. Um, and we're urging younger people to come and get involved. And there's going to be a ton of organizations. Um, if you need help to like register for voting, we can have people there um, helping for that. And just to get involved in this movement, because March 24th is, what, 10 days later. Um, and that's going to be where all of the schools come together and all of the students for that meeting. Yeah, and the community too. So what do you have planned uh, in your campus, in your school? Uh, well, I'm one of the school of students. Uh, today was my last day of school. I'm on uh -huh. spring break now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, I'm so glad to be here. It's so great. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm meeting with people and we're trying to get a group of us to come to UH. We're very happy to be invited there. My friend and I will be saying speeches and trying to really empower the, the um, high school students who are able to come to the march. I've been reaching out to different schools to see if they are on spring break, if they want to do something, because I think it is sort of, I don't know, it's kind of like, uh, it's, it makes you feel smaller when it's like you're on spring break but you want to have a walkout. Um, so we're very happy that we'll be able to go to UH. Yeah. And it's actually, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's important to say that the 14th is kind of the, the first day of mm -hmm. the, the activation of the movements. Um, and it's, the 14th is for the, for the walkout to memorialize the 17 right. people that lost their lives. But to bring awareness that on the 24th, you know, we're marching again. On the mm -hmm. April 20th, a lot of students are doing something for the anniversary of the Columbine okay. shooting. Um, right now in Hawaii, we have the bump stock ban going through legislation. We're trying to bring awareness to that. 
The NRA has specifically asked that people fight against it here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So we're asking specifically that you fight for it. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, it is very interesting because uh, we actually are in one of those very special states where we're already in very good shape with our legislation, but even to go further, uh, it sets the tone also for all the states who are kind of halfway through or who may be wanting to look at uh, a state that's been modeling, you know, the example that we should follow. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to talk to you both about uh, a big part of this movement has to do with education and mobilization and gathering together, of course. Mm -hmm. And just like in any movement, like if you think about civil rights movement, for example, uh, the voting aspect mm -hmm. of it made a big difference because uh, uh, we can huff and puff and talk about as much as we want, but what we want and think we wish to see happening at a uh, uh, legislative level, uh, either locally, you know, statewide or federally. Right. However, uh, the... <laughs> You know, we, we hit the road uh, running mm -hmm. when it comes down to constituency, civic engagement, and the power of voting. Right. So I would like to hear both of your perspectives on that. So Mackenzie, may I ask how old you are? I am, on, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm actually 17. 17. And when people ask me, what are you most excited for? I'm like, uh -huh. I get to vote. And I get to vote like soon. And I'm, uh, yes. I, yeah. So let's talk about that because so this is going to be your first time My voting. My first time. I actually and you registered already. I am. Yes. <laughs> so, so there is that power of registration. So like now that you're starting mm -hmm. to engage in civic engagement as a you know very young voter, <laughs> what has been your process? You know to learn about the political platform of mm -hmm. candidates and about your choice in process. And what do you want any politician who is either in the House right now or, you know, thinking about running for, you know, a position, what do you want him or her to hear from you as a voter? Oh, well, as a new voter, it is kind of exciting to think that we are the next generation of voters and we do have power and we have a different perspective than previous generations of voters. So I guess I'd like to say also that for me, it's been sort of a interesting process. I really didn't care much about politics about a year ago, two years ago maybe, and then our presidential, presidential elections came and I was like, wow, this is not right. What's happening? What's being said? Mm -hmm. That's not normal. And I, I would ask the adults and they're like, I'm sorry that this is the first presidential election you'll remember. I was really young when mm -hmm. Obama was elected and I never really cared at the time. I guess I was too young. Um, and it is interesting to me to think that people my age, it's like they're growing up in this Trump presidency. And it's hard not to care about politics. It's hard not to either choose sides to argue. And I think that what's important now is that we do keep the conversation going. We don't just say, well, I'm a Democrat, so I'm going to vote for this. I'm going to believe that. And I think that Right now, what's such an issue is this partisanship, and that that's what needs to stop. And I think that voters in my generation, in our generation, is going to end that, is going to be able to say that even though you're a Republican, you don't have to vote for this person. You can vote for what you believe in. That's a very good point. We have very few seconds left. What okay. would you like to tell to our politicians as a young voter? What I would like to say to our politicians, honestly, is honestly. like, yeah, watch out because we're growing up and, and we're the next generation and this is the next generation. And I cannot be like more proud of, of these kids and these students. And I think that a lot of us grew up with Obama as our president and saw forward progress and change. And you're not going to be able to push us back at all. And we're going to keep, you know, the momentum's coming and... 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> straight <laughs> from the young adults and, and children's mouths. So I could not have a better way to uh, end this program. I hope the both of you come back for follow-up episodes. Yeah. And uh, you want us to come back. <laughs> Absolutely, and bring your friends. Can I say hi to my brother? Yes. I made a lot. She said I better get a shout out. So Thank hey, you Nick. so very much. <laughs> and that concludes our episode of Perspectives on Global Justice for today. And that's see you next Friday. Ahoy ho! <laughs> <laughs>